Welcome to university. Hi, and welcome to university. 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 Welcome to university in Zion. Welcome, Welcome to university. university. Welcome to 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 university, Amy Zion Church. Welcome to university. 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 Stop long enough to tell you you're welcome at university. Welcome to university. Oh, welcome to university. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the University AME Zion Worship Experience. This Sunday is Flashback Sunday. Um, our entire team is taking some time to rest and recruit, but we want to continue to give you the word of God. So we have a special sermon. And I know during this time of COVID, we haven't been able to have our choir here. So we have a special selection that our choir um, recorded a few months back. So I'm grateful to have it as part of this service. We're praying that this word about walking into your destiny will bless you. Um, it was preached at the beginning of the year, but it's more relevant than ever now. You can also support our ministry by simply um, giving online or text to give. The number and information will be right at the bottom of this screen. We need your support to continue to move forward. I need you to stay connected and in contact because we have a few special things that will be happening in the next 15 to 20 days you want to really be part of it and you want to really be blessed so keep looking out for what's next from university i hope you're blessed by this sermon and this sunday god bless bye we may come through the power of god and we call the name of jesus so much power in his name <laughs> giants come down amen? amen giants do fall amen? amen and if i have a witness that we know giants fall and they do die just say giants die god is god come on giants die god giants die giants die oh somebody's testimony there's no giants die and they do fall amen amen oh put a hand praise together university amen come on put them hands together y'all
continue our series journey 2020 as I was for those of you that haven't been here the past two weeks as we were coming into 2020 you know on my news feed Steve I have all these preachers and pastors and you know they got these great flyers some of them glossy I'm um, talking about 2020 is year a year it's going to be a shift your destiny is coming and I and God bothered my spirit about that like, how do they know it's my year? What makes 2020 special? I know I woke up, I know December was one day, January was another day. What makes this so special? I mean, I read my Bible and there might be 2020 pages in it, but <laughs> there was nothing about 2020. I didn't, I didn't see that in my Bible. And as I was sitting and thinking and like wondering, you know, like, God, am I missing something? Am I missing the great revelation of 2020? God leaned into me and he said, there, there might be nothing mystical or magical about the number 2020 or the year changing or the date changing. But what it does match is the rhythms of life that I give. At, at every point, God gives moments of resurrection, created the world, and what did he do on the seventh day? He always gives moments for us to pause, rest, and reflect. So as we begin this year, we begin this new decade, I wanted us just to pause, reflect, and start moving forward. So we started off by reconciling our past. The reality is our relationship with our past is complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. Our past is not all good. It is not all bad. You know, I think it is bad theology to say, leave your past behind because your past is things that God used to shape you. They might not have all been good. They might not have been all bad, but it's still a very real part of you. And God is asking you to reconcile with certain parts of it so that you can be free and move ahead. Don't, don't, don't disdain your past. Don't try to paint it over. Some of those experiences are equipping you for what God will have you do in the future. Some of the pain that you went through and survived that nobody else can survive. And so you can talk to somebody that is in a dark place and you can let them know that the God we serve is still real because you survived and he made it out for you. So some of us are so busy hiding from our testimony and what God is shaping us into that we miss what we're doing. So we have to reconcile our past. The next thing is, we talked about being your authentic self. Being your authentic self. I know, I know, you know, this is popular. Um, 
Oprah Winfrey, Ayanna Van Sant, old network kind of terminology. You know, some people might say that's not good theology, talking about being your authentic self, but I believe it is because the reality is, is that we are each created in the image of God in a very distinct and special and beautiful way. And sometimes we spend so much time trying to be somebody else that we can't live in the present. Sometimes we're trying to live by scripts that other people have written for us, and that is not healthy. That is not what we need to do. So we need to be our authentic selves as we go through this journey. Then we are here today. And I want to talk to you about the problem with walking into your own destiny. The problem with walking into your destiny. The problem with walking into your destiny. If you go to the book of Kings, the book of Kings, second chapter, verses nine through 14. Sorry, I sent you wrong. One numero off. Let's read it from the screens. When they had crossed, Elijah and Elisha asked, what shall I do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you've asked me a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as long as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a world, went into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel as horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took his own clothes and tore them into two pieces, and he took up the cloak of Elijah and had fallen from, that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elisha that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parroted to one side and to other, and Elisha went over. The idea of stepping into your destiny makes for great social media fodder. There are a lot of great memes about I'm stepping into my destiny. There's great slogans and there are great quotes, but I don't think they really help you step into your destiny. They make you feel good for a minute. You might get a nice chuckle. You might think it's a good idea, but it doesn't help you actualize stepping into your own destiny destiny. The reality is I've heard sermons and TED Talks and all these other things about stepping into your destiny, capturing your future, grabbing what God has for you. And I'll be honest, I've shouted, I've run, I've hooped, I've cried, I've given offerings, and I'm still, as I left the place, was just as tired and frustrated as when I walked in. Actualizing our destiny is a complicated and difficult thing. How do I execute it? Am I doing the right thing? Am I working hard enough? Am I in God's will? Was that God's will or was that my ego, my conscience, my self-doubt speaking to me at this moment? How do I live into my destiny? I think is one of the most perplexing and challenging things that we can face as people. The reason is there is no map. Each of us have our own individual paths. Each of us get to success in a different way. Some of us have to take the long route around the mountain. Some of us get to climb over the mountain. Some of us don't even have to go on the mountain. God wants us to walk in the valley. But how do we get there? That's the challenge. Dr. Jordan, I, I love reading the Bible because, um, you know, it's a great book. It shows God's plan for humanity starting with Adam, the promises made to Abraham, the fulfillment of his 
grace and mercy through his son Jesus Christ down on a cross. We see the profound way that God cares for us. But one of the most attractive features to the Bible is it shows the imperfect and halting steps of men trying to live into their, men and women trying to live into their destiny. Let me show you. From the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each with their own flaws, one's a trickster, one lied about his wife. Some of them argued with God until he had to break their hip bone. But imperfectly and hauntingly, they fulfill their destiny that we almost four or 5,000 years later still remember them as fathers of the faith. Whether it is Joseph who was a boastful man and rubbed the anointing of God in his face of his brothers and he went and, and he got thrown in the pit, ended up a slave and had to deal with the challenges of being in Egypt as a slave for years and still forgave his brothers. That imperfect journey gives me hope. I still know about the imperfect journey of Moses. You know, he started in Pharaoh's house. He felt he had destiny. He thought that he was going to rescue his people. He ended up being a murderer because he was doing it outside of God's will. So he had to run to the backside of the mountain for 40 years. And God had to call him to come and free his people from Pharaoh. He still didn't get it right after that when he got in the wilderness. He did some things wrong. He did it so wrong, Fred, that he ended up not being able to go into the promised land. But we see God moving in, in imperfect people to fulfill destiny. Whether it is my God, Peter, in the New Testament, I mean, this man, this man, I mean, he, he put his foot in his mouth about 17 different times. He said, Jesus, let me walk on water. And when Jesus let him walk on water, as soon as Jesus started letting him walk, he stopped believing. So he started sinking. And what kind of sense does it make that when Jesus provides a miracle for you, you stop believing in the middle of the miracle? That was Peter. <laughs> He was so braggadocious that at the last supper, he said, I won't betray you. I won't. I'm Jesus, I am your ride or die. I got your back. I don't care what these people do. Goes up to the garden, cuts a man's ear off because he's so impetuous. But somehow his backbone got left in the garden because when he went to the chief priest's house to watch Jesus get beat by them, his backbone was in the garden because he lied three times. I don't know him. That's his friend. Stop talking to me about it. And he messed it up. But Jesus still said, Petros. You will be the rock that I will build my church on. And on the birth of the church on Pentecost, he preached a sermon of divine power. If I could preach just one sermon like that, I would go to heaven right away. Because he preached that bad and 5,000 people came to the Lord on that day. So the man that couldn't, couldn't have faith through a miracle, that was braggadocious, that lost his backbone. God still used him to birth the church because God can use imperfect vessels to build perfect things and then Paul or Saul educated man educated man stuttered on the the great rabbi Gamaliel. he was educated he believed that Christianity was a sect of Judaism that needed to be wiped out so he persecuted the church a matter of fact some theologians believe he was the first one to throw the first stone when Stephen, the first martyr of the church, died. But on that Damascus road, God blinded him, showed him a new revelation. And we, he becomes the greatest evangelist of all time. He takes this Christian faith from being just a sect in Jerusalem and makes it worldwide, man. He, well, they didn't have the car. They didn't have the internet. They didn't even have um, good sandals. But somehow he walked all over the world. 
No Birkenstocks, no Birkenstocks. He walked all over the world and spread the faith as we know it today. God works with imperfect vessels. And that is one of the characteristics of the Bible I love. So this morning, I want to talk to you about an imperfect vessel in Elisha stepping in to his destiny. For you that don't know the story of Elisha and Elisha, Elijah is probably considered one of the top five greatest alive, greatest ever in the Bible, you know, he gets referenced often. You know, we talk about Mount Carmel where he faced down um, the 400 priests of idols and slew them and God lit the fire. Then he ran from Jezebel and hid, you know, this, this Elijah has this amazing reputation. In eight years before this scripture that we're reading, he picks an understudy by the name of Elisha, Elisha. He throws a mantle on him. Elisha was minding his business, minding his business in his father's field. As he was tilling the field, Elijah walks by and throws his mantle on him. And Elisha, Elisha follows Elijah around for eight years as an understudy. As God reveals to both of them that Elijah's time is now short on earth. Elisha has to now step into his destiny. Elijah is, is, is probably would be reported to HR today if he was a boss, because he wasn't that nice to Elisha. He really was. Not, not, not in this scripture. Not in this scripture. Elijah walks to three holy places and he's trying to get rid of Elisha. Tell him, go away, go away, go away. But Elisha is still following him because he's holding on to Elijah because he doesn't want to let go because he, he doesn't want to step into his destiny. He doesn't know how. He doesn't know why. But then we get to this final moment where Elijah finally says, what do you want from me? What is the last thing? And three things happen in this moment. Elisha reimagines himself. Elisha receives. And Elisha responds. Elisha reimagines himself. Elisha receives. And Elisha responds. If you go to verse 9, when they had crossed, Elisha said to Elisha, Ask. What shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And he says, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. What Elisha understood so critically in this moment was that the tools and skills that I had before will not take me into my destiny. In order for us to step into a new season, we have to start reimagining ourselves as what the plan of God has in our life. Too many of us are bringing old tapes, old scenarios, old skills, old things into future destinies and wonder why we are thoroughly frustrated. When God is trying to create something new in you, you're so busy holding on to the old coping mechanism, the old job, the old relationship, and God is asking you to reimagine yourself as he sees you. Elisha understood that he was moving from the role of an understudy to a prophet. He moves from carrying the bag to holding the mic. He moves from being in the background to the front. So now he gets asked, what do you need? And he says, he doesn't say, I need to talk like you. He doesn't say, I need to walk like you. 
He says, I need to reimagine, have the anointing that God has on your life so my ministry can be fulfilled. How many of us are asking God to give a double portion of anointing in the next thing and next season that we do so we can be better at what we do for him in the future? Some of us are frustrated climbing and running up the hill, wondering why it feels like a treadmill because you're running the wrong way. God has a different path that's a little easier, but you're trying to do it out of your own strength, with your own knowledge, with your own experience. And God is asking you to reimagine yourself at the next season, at the next level, in the next responsibility. And you are too busy holding on to old tapes, old stories, old situations. What I need you to know this morning, university, is that I see you the way that God sees you right now. And I see you successful in new ventures in the next five to ten years. But the first thing you got to do is let go of your past, let go of your habits, let go of your weaknesses, let go of your brokenness and just lean in to God reimagining you as a new creation. Thank you. How do I know this is a fact? How do I know this is a fact? Because the, the New Testament tells me we're new creations. We're transformed. It doesn't say we're the same thing, just with better clothes. He's asking us to become a new creation, a new thing. That's what God is looking for us. He's looking for us not to be like the past, not to be like our parents. He's asking us to be a new creation. Interesting thing um, is that when you compare Elijah's and Elisha's ministry, both very anointed, both very anointed. There's no doubt that God was in their life. But Elijah's ministry was that of public um, miracles dealing with kings and nations. Elisha's, the characteristic of Elisha's ministry was meeting people in ordinary situations and blessing them. Same God, different anointing. Same God, different plan. But imagine if Elisha tried to be like Elijah, he would have missed the anointing that God had on his life. That's why you have to reimagine yourself in the way that God has for you. Now, Pastor Smith, um, that sounds good. That sounds good. But how would you have me reimagine? What's the practical? The first thing I would say is write down the things that hold you back. Don't share it with nobody. I'm going to tell you why you don't share it with anybody. Because there are things you have in your mind that you will never share with anybody that you need to think that hold you back. There are habits that you have and behaviors and things that you're duplicating from people. You need to write that down. Because that stuff doesn't need to be brought with you into the future. Then you need to spend some quiet time with God. And start thinking about what is the destiny he has for your life. <sighs> Let me tell you something. You're not going to get the whole picture at one time. You're not. That's, I mean, this, if, if you got the whole picture, why would you need faith? If you got all the answers today, why would you need faith? But you got to ask God, what's the first step? What's the second step? And let me tell you what's going to happen. It's going to, for some of us, it's going to sound outrageous. And you have to pray on it a little more. It's going to sound counterintuitive. But you have to pray on it a little bit more. And then if you keep praying, you keep getting the same sign, that's probably God talking to you very clearly. And then you have to say, how do I take this step? 
Because remember, when you reimagine yourself, you won't be in the same place, in the same atmosphere with the same people. God is going to do some different things. So in that reimagination, you have to start saying, what does that look like, God, and what's the first thing? The second thing is he receives. Verse 13. He took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the banks of the Jordan. Carrie, I was like, the Bible puzzles me. It's a very puzzling book, very puzzling book. You just saw heaven open up. Chariots come down with flames. The man you were walking with just disappeared. You shouted, and then the first thing you did was pick up the cloak. You tidied up right after you saw all of that. (laughs) It doesn't make sense to me. I'd have ran and told somebody, come back later, something. But then I remembered the beginning of the story. What was the first thing that Elijah did for Elisha? He threw the mantle on him. It was a physical manifestation of stepping in the role. The only thing that God left on the ground was the mantle. So Elisha was looking and thinking back in his memory. And he remembered the first time that he met Elijah. And Elisha receives the mantle from him. And now as he ends his relationship with Elisha, he sees the mantle. So he has a choice. He can go run and tell or he can pick it up and receive what God has for him. So he picks up the mantle so he understands that the anointing of God is still in his life. Some of us are not receiving what God would have in our life because we're too busy looking at the past. Somebody here needs to hear this. God has left a mantle on the ground in front of you and you're walking by it without picking it up. Who is missing their mantle? I don't know, but you need to pick up the mantle that God has laid in front of you and step out on faith and say, God, I understand that I'm going to receive what you have for me in my life. Alex, I believe this is a step most believers miss. God has left the mantle on the floor for them. It's there for us to pick up. But you know what the interesting thing about God is? He says we each have free will, so we have a choice. God will never force you to do anything. So you have a choice to make. Do I pick up what God has or do I keep walking the way I've been walking? Do I pick up the mantle that God has on my life or do I just keep taking the ordinary steps? Let me tell you something. It is easy to continue our lives here. Um, I know most of y'all travel schedules. Some of y'all travel a lot. Some of your mantles are probably sitting at the Delta um, TSA (laughs) security line as you walk by to go on the next trip. God is calling us to pick up some mantles and we just keep walking by while we go on vacation, while we live our everyday life, while we make simple choices. Because you know what the problem with a mantle is, Chris? Responsibility. Because once God shows you, can you keep denying him? Can you act the same way? Can you, when he opens you up to new realities, can you go back to your old reality? Are you Walking around your mantle? Because let me tell you, Jermaine, the one thing I know about mantles is nobody rushes to pick it up. A lot of people rush. So, so let me explain this. this. This is the way it gets good. 
I've been in church a long time, and, and, I, and I believe that church attracts people that need a lot of affirmation, particularly to this job, this job. So there are a lot of people that want to be in the front of the room. There's no mantle there, but they're going to run to the front. Whether it's to sing, whether it's to preach, whatever it is. But what I've noticed is that sometimes with people with the greatest calling on their life, God has spoken so deeply into them that they're scared to touch the calling because they understand that it shifts their very reality. That's why if you ever see somebody struggling with their calling, you don't push them. You let them and God work it through. Our job is not to ordain, is not to tell people they need to be preachers or worship leaders. Our job is just to open door and give them opportunity to pick up the mantle that's on the floor that God has given them. If they don't want to touch it, that's between them and God. You got to keep them in prayer. You got to encourage them. But they need to deal with God because the second they pick up that mantle, their life is going to switch. It's going to change. There's a different weight. There's a different walk. There's a different talk. There's a different level of responsibility. You can't do what everybody else does. You can't act the way everybody acts. You, but you, when you do it, there is an unlimited power that comes from Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you pick up that mantle, it's profound. Now, let me tell you something. The church has done a bad job, Dr. Jordan. They made preaching and singing the two main mantles. The kingdom of God is so diverse that there are different mantles. There are those of us that need to work in nonprofit. There are those of us that need to work in academia. That we have theologians in this room that need to think deeply and longly about the impact of the faith in a postmodern world. We have those that need to go to foreign lands and do interesting things to help those in the third world. There are those in here that we need to figure out how we can get from 6% to 7% of the people in church on a Sunday morning praising the living God that is Jesus. Christ. There are those that need to help the people in our great homeless crisis that we have. We are now living in a part of the country that favors more Mumbai than it does a first world country because we have people that are living on the bridges in cities and people that are driving by in expensive cars, going to cloistered neighborhoods. But there's a mantle for somebody in the house to start tackling and dealing with those issues. We have issues of diversity and disparity that need to be addressed. And there's a mantle that somebody's skirting around right now and not picking up. What am I telling you? I need a church that needs to get active in the world. I need a church that needs to move in the world. I need a church that needs to change in the world. I need a church that moves for people. I need a church that cares for the broken heart. I need a church that moves in God's power. The final thing, the final thing. I'm almost out of here. Thank you. The final thing is he responds. He responds. Verse 14. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the Lord, the water and saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elisha? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other side, Elisha went over. You got to notice the interesting chain of events here, Steve. Elijah asked Elisha, what can I get? What can I give you? What can I give you? And he says, give me a double portion of your anointing. Then he sees the mantle. He picks up the mantle. So he receives it. But the next thing he does is he responds. Because you can receive something. You can pick it up. But did you use it? Did you use 
Did, did you use what God has put in your heart? Did you use the mantle that you picked up? Now, what's interesting is that Elisha and Elisha walked to this place across this river, and there was no miracle of opening up the water. They found a bridge and walked across it. But as he's out, he walks, splits the water. But the tools don't match. I know um, if you look at other moments where, where water and miracles happen, it's always a staff. Moses gets to the Red Sea, parts it with a staff. Um, they get to the River Jordan, Joshua, parts of it. They, they walk in with the um, staff, and then they walk in with the ark and stand in the middle. So my man has a robe, a piece of cloth. He doesn't have a staff that did miracles. He doesn't have the ark. He got a coat. Fred, <laughs> you want to talk about wrong tool for the job, right? <laughs> if God's going to give me the power to part the river and every bit of experience before that parted the river, so the staff, ark, rope, but he rolls up the rope and he hits the river. And it parts. What is it saying to us? When you respond with what God gives you, you can. I don't know who this is for this morning. Um, the way that the people came before you got here, that's good for them. But God is giving you a robe to do new miracles. They could part the sea with a staff or an ark, but you're going to part it with a robe. I don't know what your robe is, whether it is the gift of your voice, your gift with social media, your gift in music, your gift in community organizing, your, whatever your gift is, whatever God has given you, it is so powerful that it can do miracles beyond belief. Some of us think that the days of miracles, signs, and wonders, the days of power, and the days of the church to change the world are over. But the same God that was there at creation and the same God that's going to be there at the end of time is the same God that is reigning right now. So all I need for you is to invest in the power of God and use the tools he has given you because you can change the world by just using what God has given you. Just respond to the gift that God has given you. Respond to what he said to you. Respond Respond to what, what the skills he's giving. Respond in a way. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you think you have the wrong tools. You've been comparing your tools to everybody else's. I'm not as charismatic. I don't preach that way. I don't talk that way. I'm not as sure that you give you got 50 stories on why you can't do it. Let me tell you, you're built the way you're built for a new generation. The old playbook is not going to work. God has built you for the next season. So you are looking at old tools and wondering why you're not equipped with them. <laughs> because that's for the back in the days. God is equipping you with new tools for a new season, for a new generation. So many of us are trying to recreate tools that work. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, trying to get skills and trying to be like people in the past when God is calling us to do so much more. I need you not to respond with your dad's tools and your father's tools and your mentor's tools and the person that you've seen on TV's tools and this writer or that writer. I need you to respond to God with the tools he has given you because he has given you the tools to respond in a way for such a time as this. I just need a such a time as this generation to know that you are a 
equipped perfectly for what God is doing in your life. So I just need some people not to respond like anybody else, but to respond like yourself because God is going to do more in you than he can do in the world. So greater is he that is in you than in the world. So I just need somebody that's willing to respond to stand on the feet and give God praise because you are stepping into your destiny today. You are moving where God has you. You are going to another level and another place. So all I'm asking you is just to respond to God. May we all rise. I need us all to bow our heads. If you're looking to step into, and everybody close your eyes. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. If you're looking to step into a new destiny, I just need you to raise your hand because I want to pray with you right now. Amen, 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 amen. This, you can put your hands down. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to embarrass you. God, you've put on the heart of your people hopes and dreams. You've put on the heart of your people visions of signs and wonders. You're asking them to step out on faith. But it's hard to walk in destiny, God. It's hard. So this morning, I have one simple prayer that you reassure them on the next five steps they have to take. Each time they take a step of faith, you give them a sign of affirmation. Each time they trust you and walk in a new direction, you give them a sign of hope. God, I don't need you to make it easy because we need leaders with character that have been through something. But I'm asking that you affirm them in some powerful ways, God. God, I know some people are probably wondering, you didn't ask, didn't pray for my destiny. But the reason I didn't pray for your destiny is because it's already destined in God. I don't got to pray for what's already in you, what's already coming to you, but you, I just have to pray for you to walk the path that God would have in your life. So Jesus, touch this generation and the next so they will step out in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated.